Around the fire, we learned about death. A monologue. Good morning, friends. My name is Kin Farm Singh Nongkinri. I'm a Kasi writer. Do Kin Farm is among our more easily pronounceable names. Many non Kasi friends have only managed to call me Kingpam, Kimpan, Kingpin, Fiang Fiang, and so on. The worst distortion was by Douglas Smith, an Englishman who visited the Kasi Hills in 1995. Smith's friends used to call him Dok, but Kasi's, because they could not manage that properly, called him, out of respect, Mr. Dork, but proving himself as bad as the Cassies, Mr. Dork called me Flim Flam. I consider myself a true son of the wettest place on earth, baptized by its wind-driven rain and its impregnating fork. You see, it was in Sora or Cherapunji that I was born and raised. The years of growing up among the sacred woods, panoramic hills and clear streams of Sora, among warm and compassionate neighbors, were the best part of my life despite our poverty back then. And though we left for a better life in Shillong, I find myself going back to that time again and again. I used to describe myself as a small time poet since I could not class myself a small town writer since this town used to judge books by the weight and writers by their age. Over the years, however, I have written more than poetry. I have published stories and plays in Kasi and English. I have published critical writings and translations, and now a brand new novel. I have even won two or three reputable awards. Yet still, I wonder, how should I describe myself now? My hope in life is simply this. My name as a writer should make itself heard like the sound of the wind and the rain blowing and pouring according to the season. It was for that reason that many years ago, I started writing in English. For whatever you may say about this language, cannibalistic or not, it is still the key to a wider world. And that is why my debut novel, Funeral Nights, is also in English. Several critics have described Funeral Nights as an epic from the Kasi Hills. Bidisha Singha in the Assam Tribune says, very rarely do we come across a book that leaves us in awe. 
funeral nights will do that to you. It's a book of epical proportions. In her Instagram post, Janice Parriott says, Once in a very rare while, a book comes along that is unlike anything you have seen or read before. I have been waiting so long for this, an epic from the Cassie Hills. In her Twitter feed, Nilanjana Roy says, three chapters into the 1009 page funeral nights. It's extraordinary. A big, ambitious, gorgeous book in every way. Chitra Ahantam in scroll.in says, Kin Farm Singh Nongkanri folds a vast history, mythology, and ethnography into a giant patchwork narrative. And Rini Barman, a freelance writer, calls it a book of our times for our times. But no, by telling you all this, I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I'm just letting you hear the trumpets blown by others in the hope that you too may be swayed by the music. Around the fire we learned about death is the theme given for this monologue. Is funeral nights about death then? The plot revolves around a group of friends from Shillong journeying to a remote part of West Kasi Hills to witness Kapoor Sorat, the Feast of the Dead, a unique six-day-long funeral ceremony of the Lingams, a Kasi sub-tribe. It may well be the last time this ancient rite is performed. The ceremony, involving a number of rituals and the sacrifice of as many as 50 bulls, will conclude with the cremation of a beloved elder, a woman, whose body has been preserved in a treehouse for nine whole months. The novel does talk of this strange funeral feast and the traditional death rituals of the Kasis in general. But the world of death, spirits, shamans and exotic rides is only a small part of funeral nights. The friends who travel to the West Kasi Hills have made a mistake about the date and they end up in the secluded hamlet of Nong Shirkon seven days early. Stuck in the jungle for 11 days, they spend their nights around the fire in the middle of a spacious hut built especially for them, sharing stories and debating issues in what turns out to be a journey of discovery for all of them. Funeral Nights has been described 
as a vast collection of stories, big and small. Not so much about death, but about life, past, present and future, rural and urban, high and low, about admirable men and women, rock hunters and pranksters, lovers and fools, politicians and con men, drunks and taxi drivers, about culture and history, religion and God, myth and legend. Throughout its 12 substantial chapters, the novel is divided into rude stories and little stories. And these stories, as reviewer Kanchan Verma puts it, reveal not only their specific qualities, but also their humanity and universality. Verma finds many of them hilarious, revealing the novelist's sense of humor in a range of registers, providing much needed comic relief, coming as they do immediately after every section on weighty issues concerning race, ethnic identity, and religious philosophy. The seed of funeral nights was sown at the inaugural edition of the Kovalam Literary Festival in 2008. By a quirk of fate, I was on the same dais with celebrities like Satchitanandan and Shashi Tharoor reading my self-composed poems after Tharoor's recitation of Mahmud Darwish. After the session, a lady beaming excitedly approached me and said, I must publish your poems. She introduced herself as Katika, who at the time was the publisher of HarperCollins. Among the poems I had read at the session was Blasphemous Lines for Mother. It has a line that reads, Those days in Chera, referencing Sora or Chera Punji, where I was born and spent a significant part of my childhood. Katika was intrigued by those days in Chera and suggested that I write a memoir. Instead, I promised her a book that would challenge genres, something big and bad. Have I succeeded? Jerry Pinto calls Funeral Nights the Moby Dick of Megalia, a novel of huge ambition and tremendous appetite. Or is it a novel at all? Others agree that it is a path-breaking novel in both its writing and subject. One that happily defies all attempts at constriction, that blurs the lines between fiction, non-fiction and travelogue, and in a unique way bends different genres. One reviewer in The Wire even says, if to D.H. Lawrence, Moby Dick 
is one of the strangest books in the world, Funeral Nights is, without doubt, the strangest book I have read in recent times. Its story is long and short about diverting incidents and characters fascinate me. Its rich variety and nebulous depths fill me with awe. She adds, I am especially drawn to the little stories with morals attached to them. The following is a sample story with such a maxim. One day, not too long ago, a Bengali professor issued an advertisement announcing her requirement for a housemaid who would not only look after the house but also help take care of a two-year-old son. Because the wage she offered was a rather generous one, many girls from her locality applied for the job. Seeing so many applicants, she decided to interview them so she could choose the most suitable candidate. But that presented another problem. Most of the girls were khasi and did not know much English or Hindi. What was she to do? She herself did not know much khasi. As a last resort, therefore, she sought the help of a Kasi taxi driver who used to drop her at work every day. Speaking to him in broken Kasi, she said, Bawarjri, you helped me choose housemaid, okay? Too many of them, te. Te here roughly corresponds to you see. Fine, fine, no worry, when is interview? Ba'wajri readily agreed, also speaking in broken Kasi. This is one of those strange Kasi trades. Whenever a non-Kasi speaks to them in broken Kasi, they, they respond likewise. Nobody knows why. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., Fine, fine, I come, no worry. During the interview, the girls waiting outside on the veranda were called to the drawing room one by one. When the first girl came in, the professor and Ba Wajri immediately began plying her with questions. Her name, place of stay, age, experience, and so on. But the girl was so shy that she stared at the floor, smiled foolishly to herself, and refused to say a word. The plumpish professor looked at Ba'awajri, her dark eyes questioning him, silently. Ba'awajri, who was sitting on a chair, his folded arms resting on his paunchy stomach, looking very much like a meditating Buddha, shook his head and commented, no network. The second girl was exactly the opposite. Before the interviewers could ask her questions, she began talking non-stop, boasting of her experience in housekeeping and child minding, and giving them no chance at all to speak. 
Bawadri looked at the professor, shook his head and said, customer service. The girl, the third girl was not very nicely behaved, nor did the interviewers like the way she spoke, especially when she boasted about having worked in many places around India. Ba'awadri gave the professor a sign and said, tourist taxi. And so the interview progressed with Ba'awadri rejecting one girl after another because she did not like the way they spoke or behaved or dressed. This went on for some time and the professor was getting quite anxious. At last, a girl came in who seemed well suited for the job. She was well behaved, clean and neatly dressed. When they asked her questions, she answered them clearly and politely. She was really perfect in every way. Even Bawadri was impressed with her. He looked at the professor, nodded and said, Maruti 800, best for Shillong conditions. And the moral given by one of the characters is, separate the rice from the husk. Andrew Linkoy, one of my most dedicated readers, says, I have many favorite maxims, but the most beautiful to my mind, he adds, is from a story about two coolies, a Kasi and an Nepali. Love knows no otherness. And the most hilarious is from a story about a woman who keeps forgiving her scoundrelly husband, though he comes to her only when her belly is flat. To forgive is divine, but to keep on forgiving is bovine. It is this serial comic attitude to life that largely defines the book. Madhulika Little in the Indian Express says, I began this book with trepidation. 1,000 pages seemed daunting. But the way this book reads, it did not feel weighty and tedious. It was more like sitting down with old friends and listening to conversations. Amusing, enlightening, witty conversations that opened my eyes made me think. Lovely words. Thank you, everyone. Kublai.